Good morning. It is Tuesday, April the 12th, and this is The Drill. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, the Pledge of Allegiance, and the Star-Spangled Banner, we will have Sean versus Sean, Politics is Change, Mike Gallagher, Racial Backfire, No Free Lunch, Overweight, and Alter Boy. All that and more when I come back. Thank you. And now the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare for April the 12th. I've given you power to release yourself from the curse of lust and perversion. My child, I've given you the gift of my Holy Spirit, who is powerful and strong, and who will save you from the curse of lust and perversion that has affected the generations with whom you dwell. Trust my Holy Spirit to give you the power to release yourself from the spirits of lust and perversion. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Let perverse lips be far from you, and let your eyes look straight ahead. Ponder the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left, and keep your foot removed from evil. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. Prayer Declaration Holy Spirit, fill me with the power to set myself free from all lust and perversion. I will no longer live under the curse of a perverse heart. And I commit to you today to keep my lips free from perversion and my eyes looking straight at you. Let all my ways be established in righteousness and continue giving me the strength to remove my feet from all evil. Amen. And that was the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare for April the 12th. Thank you, thank you. Who is the true conservative? He is religious and realistic. He is the person that understands that culture is the foundation for politics. He acknowledges a benevolent universe. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He's open-minded, asking why rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He is a normal American.
Thank you, thank you. What is the true conservative strategy for defeating socialists in this country? Number one, we must properly define conservatism. Then we must organize all potential conservatives under that definition. Once organized, we must dominate American culture. Dominating American culture means that we must rid ourselves of all the various cults the left has foisted upon us in this country. We rid ourselves of the left-wing cults by promoting value. What are the universal values? Number one, life. Number two, privacy. Number three, time. Number four, sanity. Number five, productivity. We defeat promiscuity by promoting family and privacy. Socialists must be driven from positions of power. And since it is lefty counterculture that provides the foundation for their political success, true conservatives must resist left-wing counterculture and promote normal American culture. By changing our culture, we will change our politics. And we change the culture by getting married, creating a family, and raising our children. Thank you, thank you. What are the tactics in support of the strategy to rid America of socialist influence? The long-term tactics are to be a true conservative. Talk like a conservative, act like a conservative, dress like a conservative, think like a conservative. The short-term tactics are rhetorical. True conservatives need to win all of the arguments. True conservatives need to defeat the useful idiots on the left that populate their households, workplaces, and churches. That means don't be neutral. Don't try to prove a negative. Don't take their word for it and ask lots of questions. The useful idiots are the people that simply repeat the latest talking points. Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative political priorities? Number one, a constitutional amendment banning abortion throughout the country. Number two, make nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons obsolete. Number three, the immediate decertification of all public employee unions. Number four, the immediate assignment of criminal and civil liability to all government regulators. Number five, the immediate repeal of the so-called Patriot Act. Number six, the immediate repeal of all dictator laws. Number seven, the reinstatement of writs of outlawry. Number eight, government-sponsored recalls, ballot initiatives, and referendums. Number nine, a flexible minimum wage. Number 10, means-tested health care. And number 11, the immediate and permanent prohibition of investment banking by any office holder. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative cultural priorities? Number one, bring back not-for-profit news. Number two, defeat the cult of promiscuity with the promotion of privacy. Number three, defeat the cult of neutrality with the effective use of propaganda. Number four, defeat the cult of personality by emphasizing character. Number five, defeat the cult of imagination, psychology, and Hollywood with religion and research. Number six, defeat the cult of reinvention by admitting one's mistakes. Number seven, defeat the cult of death abortion, infanticide, and assisted suicide. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. The biggest mistakes that right-wing talk show hosts make. Number one, they fail to consult their consciences. Number two, they fail to listen to their own shows. Number three, they aid and abet the left. Number four, they demoralize their audiences. Number five, they contradict themselves. (laughs) 
Thank you, thank you. Left-wing, right-wing vocabulary. The left says, going forward. The right says, from now on. The left says, homeless. The right says, squatter. The left says, migrant. The right says, fugitive. The left says, eliminate. The right says, reduce. Thank you, thank you. So the true conservative, everything in politics, let's start with with what is politics? What is the essence of politics? The essence of all politics is change. Questions about, debates about change. Whether or not we as a society should change, and if so, uh, what would we should we change from and to and uh, all the details uh, therein. There's three basic positions on change. You have the left's position, the traditionalist position, and the conservative position or the right uh, right's position. The left's position on change is to presume change. That's what they do. They presume change. Why not this? Why not that? Why not the other thing? Why not uh, single payer? Why not legalize uh, the recreational use of marijuana? Why not abortion on demand, for instance? The uh, traditionalist is uh, reactionary and simply says, and is closed-minded and says no to all changes, no matter what they are. <clears throat> We've been doing th- things a certain way, uh, for decades, centuries, days, weeks, months, whatever it happens to be, and there's no reason to change ever. And so the traditionalist resists change and uh, has to be forced to change. The true conservative makes the presumption for the status quo. So you have the left that makes the presumption for change, the traditionalist that makes uh, the presumption for no change, and the the um, tr- uh, the right wing or the true conservative that makes the presumption for the status quo, but will change, but you have to prove it. Whoever it is that's asking for change, it'll always be the left that's asking for change has to prove it. If you want abortion on demand, prove it. If you want a single payer health care, prove it. If you want to legalize the recreational use of marijuana, prove it. The burden of proof is always on the people that want change. And if you can convince me that those changes are necessary, fine. But until you do, the answer is no. No to the recreational use of marijuana. No to abortion on demand. No to single pay or health care. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So Sean Hannity is having uh, Sean Penn. The maybe maybe that's the reason he did it. But anyways, so he's having Sean Penn on his show, and the reason that he's doing this is because he thinks that he and conservatives, conservatives in general have something to prove, something to prove to the population at large, and more specifically, something to prove to the left. So this way, he can say. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm not such a bad guy because I'm willing to have an asshole lefty like Sean Penn on my show. And shame on Sean Hannity for doing this. Uh, he All he ends up doing is making every conservative in the country, the true conservative, me, look bad. Now, I'm expected, I suppose, to uh, have the same insecurity that Sean Hannity has and run around trying to prove to the left whatever it is that I'm supposed to be proving, proving that I'm not such a bad guy, uh, proving maybe that I'm not an extremist, uh, proving that I'm relevant, whatever, whatever the case may be. And that is unnecessary. No 
true conservative has anything to prove, not to anybody at any time, anywhere. It is the left that has something to prove. It is the left that presumes change and therefore must prove that change is necessary. Again, the true conservative, because we make the presumption for the status quo, has nothing to prove to anybody at any time, anywhere, for any reason. Thank you, thank you. Mike Gallagher it has a little segment that's been on the uh, Hugh Hewitt show on YouTube. I guess it's a substitute for a commercial. But anyways, he is complaining about a, a an individual named Gould. Uh, David Gould, I believe is his name. He's supposedly a comedian. And he quotes David Gould as saying that it is, is odd that now that Rush Limbaugh is dead, nobody ever talks about him anymore, and that Rush Limbaugh has made no lasting contributions to society at all. And then um, Mr. Gallagher goes ahead to uh, basically defend uh, Rush Limbaugh and ex- basically compare Rush Limbaugh to Mr. Gould and um, make claims that uh, Mr. Limbaugh has contributed far more to society that Mr. Gould has. Mr. Gallagher loses the argument. And he loses the argument for simple reason because he's lured into uh, one of the oldest fallacies in the book. And it's called Take My Word For It. Uh, Another way of uh, approaching this fallacy is uh, everything is true until proven false. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. But this is the way the left and Mr. Gould operate. They start... This is the way they get you to try to prove negatives, is they start by making an arbitrary claim. Mr. Gould went ahead and said um, that Rush Limbaugh has made no contribution. He may he gives no evidence of that. None. Zero. He is demanding that you take his word for it. And if you take his word for it, there's no way for you as a conservative to win that argument. You can't do it. It is impossible. What you must do is redirect your energies into getting him to prove his point. When he comes out and says, Mr. Uh, Limbaugh, or anybody for that matter, has made no lasting value or contribution to our society, the first thing out of your mouth should be a question. Really, how so? How do you know? Are you sure? Okay, you ask questions like that, and you put him on the spot Make him prove it. And if he stammers and stutters or tries to change the subject, you say, you know what, maybe we should talk about this some other time when you're better prepared. Have a nice day. And then walk away. Okay, anybody, this is a good lesson for anybody you're dealing with at work who are in the habit of getting talking points. Because that's what Mr. Gould is really doing. He's trying to gin up a talking point that is you're, is going to catch up with you uh, later on. Maybe at work. Maybe you're in your own house uh, with the lefties in your house. Maybe at church. Uh, maybe at the uh, AYSO soccer field. Whatever it happens to be. And so you need to be prepared for it. And the best way to prepare yourself is always have two, three, four questions that are are general suitable for generally any um, arbitrary statement or claim, such as how so. Um, how do you know? Are you sure? Those kinds of questions now put the individual appropriately, the person that's making these arbitrary claims, on the spot, demanding that these individuals prove their point. Uh, Rush Limbaugh didn't uh, uh, do this. Prove it. Prove it. And that when you're dealing with the Useful idiots, the useful idiots are the people who just go out and get their talking points from television. Uh, They're not going to be able to prove it because Mr. Gould didn't provide any proof. So it's going to shut them up immediately. So again, review, never take their word for it. And I've said um, in my, and I say every day on my uh, podcast, is uh, one of the tactics is don't take their word for it. 
They always open by making an arbitrary claim. They provide no support, no proof, no evidence in support of that claim. It's therefore arbitrary, and uh, I have to prove nothing at that particular point. And again, in general, true conservatives have nothing to prove to anyone. We make the presumption for the status quo. The status quo is axiomatic. It is obvious. It requires no proof or evidence. So we make the presumption for the status quo. We, therefore, have nothing to prove to anyone, anywhere, at any time, for any reason. It is the left that has the burden of proof, always. Remember that. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the right or the left always backfires. They're always their their uh, whatever efforts that they're making to get to socialist paradise always end up backfiring. And uh, the examples of that are in the empowerment of women that actually ended up empowering men, uh, the empowerment of blacks and Hispanics that actually end up empowering white people. And now they're at it again. <clears throat> one of the ways, excuse me, one of the ways that they are going to get rid of whiteness because this, this was the, there's a professor at Harvard that started all this, uh, late, the latest nonsense, um, and, it, uh, with, um, via whites and, uh, whiteness. Now it's called white privilege. So, but the way they're, they're going to do, do away with white privilege now is in uh, news, newspapers like the New York Times, they're going to refuse to uh, deal with the race of the uh, of a perpetrator in a particular crime. Uh, yesterday, there was a shooting in a subway, uh, or yesterday or today, a shooting in a subway, which uh, six people were injured. And in one particular, uh, somebody, I guess, didn't get the memo, and they described it as a black male. But the New York Times refuses to put out uh, a, a physical description of the individual may be citing that they're five foot five, but other than that, no racial description. So the, but the problem for the left is this. If you're going to get rid of whiteness, okay, does that mean that you're no longer going to describe the race of individuals that are suspects if they're black or Hispanic? Okay, but you will describe the race of the white person. You'll say, well, that's a white suspect, blah, blah. If you do that, then every time you come out and, and refuse to describe the race of the uh, perpetrator, then we can assume that the person was either black or Hispanic. You're already flagging or signaling to everybody that these folks are minorities. If, on the other hand, you decide, well, in, in order not to give it away, we'll just not, we will, will refuse to uh, state the race of the suspect in, in its entirety, for no matter what race they are, then aren't you going ahead and covering for white people. And again, white people will end up getting a privilege. So again, because these folks want to defy reality, whenever you defy reality, it smacks you in the face sooner or later. With uh, women, it was uh, go ahead and have abortions. Here's the pill. Go out and be sexually promiscuous. And men are as sexually promiscuous men. Frat boys are having a great time. It is the women that are paying the price. The women that are having to put their legs in the stirrups. And men are out uh, uh, getting their freak on uh, all the more. They're just loving it. They're loving abortion. They're loving um, a. a um, they're loving all of this stuff. So then um, you have uh, the case with uh, blacks where because of diversity, the push for diversity, if they continue to push for, for um, in, integration, things would be fine. But they didn't. The left said, oh, no, 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 we got to have diversity. So we got to have pride. You got to pride in your heritage. And the whole idea was to create some type of uh, friction within the community that is going to uh, escalate into revolution and socialist paradise. Of course, that didn't end up happening. Uh, what ended up happening was white men and white women, for that matter, became free. We are no longer um, 
uh, looked, we no longer have a KKK member looking over our shoulders, wanting to know, uh, gee, why are you eating Mexican food? Why are you eating chitlins or, or uh, greens? Why are you hanging out talking with that black person? Okay, it used to be that way prior to the Civil Rights Act and whatnot. Uh, it was white people that had all, all the pressure on them. You got a, there was always somebody there to put you in check if you got out of line, if you weren't white enough. Now the roles are reversed and the issue is for uh, blacks and Hispanics. Every day they get up in the morning, they have to prove and reprove to their friends and families how Mexican or how black they are. Okay, and that's the the reason that we have uh, this BS that we got going on today, the getting rid of whiteness and all that, is because uh, this outraged the so-called thinkers at Harvard. They said that's just outrageous. We can have it where where whites are even better off when we went out and empowered Hispanics and empowered blacks, but white men are better off than before. That's outrageous. So this is the latest effort to try to re-empower. Uh, blacks and Hispanics, and again, it's not only failing, it's backfiring. Thank you. Thank you. There's no free lunch. A success, quote, a successful economy depends on the proliferation of the rich, on creating a large class of risk-taking men who are willing to shun the easy channels of a comfortable life in order to create new enterprise, win huge profits, and invest them again, unquote. George Gilder. For all the talk about self-interest and what it means for the economic system and where the potential for a virtuous cycle lies, we must never forget that even beyond the profit motive and self-interest, phrases that are easily migrated into the unseemly and pejorative, is risk-taking. Those acting in self-interest do not have access to a free lunch either. Not only does the profit motive lead to all sorts of economic benefit, but it requires the actor in pursuit of it to take risk and make sacrifices. This perspective ought to soften the demonization of the profit-seeking actor, especially since that demonization is so wrong-headed to begin with. And that was, there's no free lunch. Thank you, thank you. And now from the book, um, The Collapse of Parenting is uh, chapter two. Uh, how, why is it that so many kids are overweight? Researchers now generally agree on three factors that have driven the rise in obesity and overweight and the decline in fitness among children. Those three factors are, one, what kids eat, two, what kids do, three, how much kids sleep. Other factors such as endocrine disruptors, intestinal bacteria, consumption of genetically modified wheat, and antibiotics may play a role, but there is less consensus regarding those other factors. Let's talk about factors 1, 2, and 3 so you can see the pivotal role played by parental authority or more precisely by the abdication of parental authority and by parents' role confusion in each of those factors. What kids eat. Healthy foods have given way to less healthy foods and beverages in the diet of the average American kid. Pizza, french fries, potato chips, ice cream, and soda have displaced fruit, vegetables, and milk. This change has not occurred in every American household, but it has occurred in many. When parents are unequivocally in charge, then the parents decide what is for supper and their kids either eat what is offered or they go hungry. That was the norm in America families as recently as the 1970s, but today it is the exception. In the 1970s, it was common for parents to say, no dessert until you eat your broccoli and no snacking between meals. Some American parents still insist on such rules, but they are now the minority. Per capita consumption of soda nearly tripled for teenage boys in the United States between 1978 and 1994. Between 1977 and 1995, the percentage of meals which Americans ate at fast food restaurants increased by 200%. Some American schools even tried to raise money by installing vending machines selling Coke, Pepsi, Pop-Tarts, and Doritos. 
Federal regulations that took effect in 2014 are supposed to prohibit the sale of junk food and sugary drinks in schools. And speaking of school, in the 2009 to 2010 school year, National School Lunch Program spent $450 million on pizza, $241 million on chicken nuggets, and $104 million on hamburgers. Michelle Obama was a cheerleader for the federal statute that took effect in 2010 that mandated a phase-in of healthier meals in American schools, not just for kids who get their lunches for free through the National School Lunch Program, but for all kids who eat in public schools, including kids who pay for their lunch. The bill was named the Healthy, Hunger-Free Kids Act. It required schools to offer healthier foods at lunch and remove some of the less healthy options. Four years later, in 2014, a pundit joked that the new law had resulted in healthy, hungry, free trash cans because much of the healthy food was being rejected by kids and was ending up in the trash. In October 2014, the National School Boards Association reported that 84% of American school districts reported an increase in wasted food after the law took effect and 76% saw a decrease in student participation in the lunch program. Michelle Obama publicly expressed her dissatisfaction with reports that much of the healthy food mandated by the new law was being trashed. She alleged that administrators in some school districts just sit back and say, oh, the kids like junk food, so let's just give them junk food. She asserted that if more districts put more effort into marketing the new meals to kids, then the meals would be more popular. With all due respect, I think the First Lady was mistaken to put the blame on a supposed lack of enthusiasm by district administrators. American children today grow up in a culture in which their desires are paramount, in which school lessons are often presented as entertainment, in which university professors are graded by students based in part on how much fun their classes are. In such a culture, it is unreasonable to expect kids to accept broccoli and Brussels sprouts without protest when they are accustomed to pizza and French fries. In districts serving affluent neighborhoods, many kids have started bringing their own brown bag lunches rather than buying the healthier lunches mandated by the new law. Especially in more affluent neighborhoods where kids have many options, it is unrealistic to expect that simply offering kids healthy choices will consistently and reliably lead to kids making healthier choices. Parents, especially affluent parents, now commonly carry bags of snacks in the car on the way to and from school. Heaven forbid that the child should experience even a moment of hunger. I don't want them to get hypoglycemic, one parent told me, as I watched her lug a cooler of refrigerated snacks into the car for the 30-minute trip to her children's private school. I didn't criticize. Better that the kids should eat carrot sticks from home than they should stop at Burger King for a cheeseburger and fries. New evidence suggests that allowing kids to have on-demand access to food may be one factor promoting obesity independent of the total number of calories consumed. Ad-lib feeding throughout the day seems to disrupt circadian rhythms, interfering with normal metabolism, and disturbing the balance of hormones that regulate appetite. Recent studies with laboratory animals have found that animals with ad-lib access to food become fatter than animals with only scheduled access to food, even when the total calories consumed are kept the same in the two groups. Restricting the amount of time when food is available to 9 or 12 hours out of 24 without restricting calories improves health and brings weight back to normal. Time-restricted eating didn't just prevent but also reversed obesity, one doctor said, an author of one of the studies cited here. Anyhow, when one did a, a few minutes of, when did a few minutes of hunger become unacceptable? When kids have the final say, then parents must make every effort to ensure that kids are not uncomfortable, not even for five minutes. Hunger, even just on the car ride home from school, is now intolerable. Kids who have never been hungry will grow up to be heavier, yet psychologically they're likely to be more fragile. They haven't learned to master their own needs. When parents begin to cede control to their kids, food choices often are the first thing to slide. No dessert until you eat your broccoli morphs into... How about if you eat three bites of broccoli, and then you can have dessert? As I described earlier, the command has melted into a request or a question capped with a bribe. Recently, I was at a restaurant where I watched a well-dressed father pleading with his daughter, who looked to be about five years old. Honey, could you please do me a favor? Could you please just try a, a bite of your green peas? Kids take such appeals literally. If this girl does condescend to eat a bite of her green peas, she is likely to believe that she has done her father a favor 
and that he now owes her a favor in return. And that was what do kids eat from chapter 2. Uh, why is it that kids are getting uh, heavier, fatter? And uh, next time we will be covering what kids do. Back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see. Um, now we're going to be uh, reading chapter 12, My First Mass, An Altar Boy's Hell, from the book Tales from My Bicentennial Year by Michael Buell, a story of a family uh, growing up in uh, Gansevoort, New York, which is in the Adirondacks. And uh, this was from uh, 1975 to 1976. On Wednesday night at my altar boy practice, Tyrone and Father H. gave me the good news that this Sunday Mass would be mine and that we had rehearsed and practiced enough. They both assured me over and over that I was ready. My first solo altar boy mass would be this Sunday. That evening, when I told my mom, she was absolutely thrilled and proud with this news. My pop's comment was, don't mess it up. Sunday morning came with its usual speed, especially since I did not want it to come at all. I got up and ate breakfast, for which me, for which for me consisted of both eating and my favorite Sunday morning ritual of psychologically abusing my younger sisters. I grabbed my bowl and poured my favorite Cheerios. I'm sure that Fruit Loops or Cocoa Puffs would have been really my favorite, but sugar cereals were strictly forbidden in our house. Cheerios was my favorite of the cereals we actually had in the cupboard. Our choices were typically cornflakes, Cheerios, sometimes kicks, or shredded wheat. Yuck. Actually, those names I gave were just wrong. Um, now that I think about it, we did not have Kellogg's Corn Flakes. We had black and white brand flakes of corn, etc. I think the Cheerios were called something like Toasted O's. I like to get the Cheerios really soggy before eating them. To me, they tasted better and were easier on the palate. Then I would make myself some toast and spoon on a couple of heads of soggy O's on the bread. It was the best ever. You had the soggy taste of the O's mixed with the crunch of the bread. You had to eat it right away. You could not let the bread get soggy. Then it was terrible. With a few chews of bread and mushy Cheerios in my mouth, I would then open my mouth and stare at Chris and Karen. I would then point to the mess of food in my mouth and act like I was going to spit it at them. This non-stop staring, of course, prompted cries of, Mom, 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 Mike won't stop staring at us and we can't eat. It's gross. He's showing us his chewed up soggy Cheerios. If just my mom was up, I probably could do this three or four dozen times until she went absolutely insane. If my dad was up, the fun stopped after just two attempts. The mornings were not the best time to test his temperament. My dad had a pretty set Sunday morning routine. He would get up and say good morning to everybody. He would then proceed over to the table and sorted through his newspapers. Earlier in the morning, before he got up, Mom would send me out to the mailbox to get the morning papers for my dad. He flipped through the Post Star Sunday paper until he found the sports section. Then he yawned and stretched out his arms, picked up the sports page back up, and headed to the only bathroom in the house. There, he spent the next several hours. It was not good if you had to go to the bathroom while he was in there. Do not, do not disturb was a well-known rule in our house. Even worse for you if you had to go to the bathroom while he was in there. You could not hurry him up. Do not disturb was the rule. You had to hold it. You had to jump around, dance, and shake your legs. Whatever, you could not go. Then, uh, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Then when he finally did come out, you had to go in. Why was this a bad thing? Because the old man knew how to stink up a bathroom, especially on Sunday morning. He would eventually make it out. He walked out with his shirt undone, fixing his watch on his wrist. He would look up real quick at my mom and say, Rita, coffee. My mom would get him his coffee, put his cream in it, and bring it over to him at his spot on the kitchen table. There, the papers where he laid out for them, and he began to read. Again, the do not disturb sign was turned on. 
If this routine was upset for any reason, the man went from being Gene Kelly singing good morning, good morning, good morning to you and you and you and you to Jim Croce belting out bad, bad Leroy Brown. This particular Sunday, I was not too pleased with him for setting me up with all this church stuff. I was really catching heck from all the guys. So I decided to pick up the mental torture of my sisters again. I was a little smarter in that I moved from the kitchen table to the living room where my sisters were watching Sesame Street, very peaceably, I might add. It was almost a shame to begin my torture. While Pops was reading the Sunday paper was the absolute best and easiest time to get him going. He wanted to believe that he could actually sit and read the paper undisturbed. And you know what? Looking back on it now, he certainly deserved a few minutes of peace to read the paper. But at the time, I had to do what I had to do. I went back into the kitchen and poured myself another bowl of O's and walked back out into the living room. I was lucky in that I made it out to the living room with a bowl of cereal. Eating in the living room was a major no-no, but I made it. I let the O's get soggy and then chewed them up a bit. Then I opened my mouth and started staring at my sisters. At first, they just ignored me, pretending not to look at me. So I moved onto the floor right in front of the TV and turned around with my mouth open, looking right at them. The first few screams of my sisters out to my mom in the kitchen led to only token yells from my mom. Michael, stop it. We've already gone over this, she half yelled. Now she knew, I knew, my dad knew, and my sisters knew that uh, that was not enough to stop me. The key to the game for me now was to push him far enough to upset his morning as payback for the church thing, but not far enough to upset my own morning with escalated punishment. I lost this one. I had continued the staring and upped it up more by switching the TV channel from Sesame Street to something called Meet the Press. After that, I upped it more by throwing soggy O's at them. After about the 900th warning, my dad turned into George the Animal Steel from the WWF. He threw down his paper, which knocked over his coffee, and ran towards me. His glasses were hanging down his nose, trying to hide his beet red face. His teeth were gritted shut, his lips quivering. I heard only a few sounds, but I was able to make out Michael Joseph Buell, Jesus Mary. <laughs> For a religious man, he was able to garner up a few unholy words every now and then. He bent down, scooped me up. Now he was running while carrying me towards my bedroom. He skidded to a stop at the doorway to my room and threw me into my bed. This was a good bit away from the door, but I made it. I was now grounded to my room for the entire Sunday only allowed out for church, of course, and meals. The punishment fits the crime. I had to get to church about an hour early so that I could make sure everything was set up. My dad dropped me off and told me, just remember what Tyrone taught you and relax. You can do it. If you're not a Catholic, you have no idea what pressure they put on a 10-year-old kid. The position was then called altar boy. Today they call it acolytes, and they even let girls do it. To me, it was like a big play every Sunday. The priest had the starring role, with the readers kind of like supporting actors. You have the choir and organ for the musical numbers, and we altar boys were like stagehands and extras. We never got a speaking part, and we were always blamed if something did not go right. In our church, the stage was the altar. On stage right was the baptismal font area, and on stage left was the sacristy. This is where God hung out all the time. You could go there any time and be guaranteed he was listening to you. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Before the place started, it was my job to turn on all the lights, light all the candles, make sure all the mistletoes were out in the pews, check the communion uh, wa wafers, and make sure we had enough. Fill the water and wine chalices, make sure all the big books were in their place, and if it was winter and snowing, make sure all the sidewalks were shoveled and salted. Tyrone had prepared a little checklist for me. I carefully read through it, checked everything off. I was ready for the play to start. Action. As the folks from our town started piling into the church, I had to stand there in the front entrance and greet everyone with Father H. This was totally embarrassing. Every person I knew was staring at me, laughing at me, whispering under their breath. In actuality, they did not even see me. They were all too busy saying hi to Father H. Mr. and Mrs. Mike C. and his family came up to say hi. 
Mike C. was cracking up hard. I could tell he was having a tough time from keeping his pudgy, round Italian face from exploding with laughter. More and more families came by and made their way in. Father H. handed me a book and asked me to go place it on his chair on the altar. As I started up the aisle, a small miracle happened. It must be God's divine intervention. Mr. C. and Mike C. were walking back down towards Father H. Mike C. breezed past me with his face down, no more smiling now. I had to see what this was about, so I turned right around and headed back down right behind them. Big John C. looked at Father H. and then down at Mike C. and asked Father H., Is it too late for Mike to serve as an altar boy this year? He was just mentioning to me how much he really wanted to do it. Father H. looked at me and uh, winded and replied loudly enough for the rest of our crew to hear him as well, God always has room for those people who want to serve. Thank you, Mike, for helping out. He then slapped Mike C. on the back, welcoming him to our little helpers club. I also congratulated Mike C. on his choice. I spoke up and said, Father, Mike can start this Wednesday at our normal weekly practice at 5.30, can't he? Oh, sure, that's a great idea, Father H. acknowledged. As the play, I mean mass, started and continued on, I was doing great, hitting all my marks, as they would say in the theater. I held up all the books to Father H. at the right time, brought out the water and toweled Father H. at the right time, picked up the gifts and put them away held the water and wine, and placed them back on the altar. The only thing I had left to do was hold the little gold plate under each person's chin as they came up for communion. Then I had to take the chalices off the altar and put them on the little table when Father H. was done. Communion finished up okay. I made it through without jabbing anyone in the throat with this gold plate. I put all the things away. Now I could sit down in my little chair next to Father H.'s big chair. The choir was filling time with one of their musical numbers, Amazing Grace. Father H. leaned over to me in my chair and whispered for me to relight that candle over by the choir that must have blown out. Okay, I said to myself, no problem. I went to the little table, lifted up the little tablecloth that covered the drawer that the matches were in, took the matches out, walked over to the candle. Amazing Grace was still being sung in the background. This candle was sitting on the front of the stage right next to the wall. Stage right, because of the limited size of our church, had right in front of it a small organ. The choir stood around the organ and sang from it. I lit the match and then lit the candle. Thank the Lord. The match lit and the candle lit. I had accomplished the mission. I shook the match in the air a few times to blow it out. I wasn't sure what to do with the spent match so I put it in on top of the book of matches and back in the drawer. I walked back over and sat down next to Father H. As soon as I sat down, Father H. stood up and thanked the congregation for coming and asked everyone to please give Mike a round of applause as this is his first Mass serving all by himself and he is doing a wonder. At that moment, smoke started billowing from my little table. The linen had somehow caught fire from the matches, and now the entire table, was, with all the chalices on it, was engulfed in smoke and flames. Mr. C., who was always sat in the first pew, jumped up and went over to the table, took the chalices off, set them down, grabbed the flaming linen, folded in on top of itself to put out the flames. He then started walking past me and Father H. on his way out of the church and picked up right where Father H. left off. Wonderful job, said Mr. C. out loud. The laughter and applause broke out. That may have been the most embarrassing moment in my life. I had done a perfect job, and then the candle went out. Oh, well. To make it worse, I had to stand to Father H. and say goodbye to everyone my earlier victory of watching Mike C. was sweet, but all gone. I stayed after everyone left and picked up everything Father H. and I opened all the windows and waved towels around trying to clear the church of all the smoky smell. Father H. asked me to come outside. He wanted to talk to me. We stood out in the front of the big doors of the church. He lit up his Marlboro and motioned me to sit down on the railing next to him. Then he said, Look, Mike, it was an accident. You did a great job. You have a lot of dedication, and you can't let one mistake 
as noticeable as it was, bother you. Remember, God works in mysterious ways, and today he was working on you, teaching you a lesson somehow. All I kept thinking of was God getting me back for ruining Pop's Sunday morning. Listen, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, get your stuff, and let me give you a ride home. And that was uh, chapter 12, the um, my first mass, an altar boy's hell. And next time, we'll be reading chapter 13, Happy Halloween. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Who is the socialist? He is the man that is spiritual. He's the man that seeks consensus. He's subjective, petty, and small, taking everything in life personally. He's outrageous, boring, and rude. He pretends to be a leader and a change agent. He pretends that he's your friend. He is sly, cunning, and deceptive. He dresses, acts, and speaks like a slob. He is informal and terminally unique. He is childish and pretends that he knows nothing. He has no conscience and pretends that might makes right and that the ends justify the means. He is impulsive and rationalizes his behavior. He is deterministic, blaming others for his mistakes. He is skeptical, demanding that others solve his problems. His unreasonableness and irresponsibility make him a bad role model, bad father, brother, family member, friend, and a bad person, period. So if you think that you can be friends with a socialist, think again. Thank you, thank you. This is uh, Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, uh, bidding uh, adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you to tune in to the John and Ken show, which is an excellent example of uh, how uh, true conservatives communicate. It's a radio show that's on KFI AM 640 from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 6 o'clock in the evening, uh, Monday through Friday, uh, and that's Pacific time. So that's an excellent show to listen to. And uh, other than that, until uh, next time, remember to be honest, to be smart, to be beautiful, and to remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win. <laughs>